Thanks. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and of course, thanks to all of you for attending uh, this session on this beautiful day. And also thank you for uh, the Swiss CFA for well, having me here, let's say. Um, I have been uh, involved in scenario analysis basically since the early days of my professional life, uh, both on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the business side, but also on the academic side. This was already mentioned uh, in the introduction. Um, that goes back almost 20 years. So since that time, I've been yeah, spending most of my working life on, on scenario analysis. So hopefully, I can make it worth your while uh, for this hour. Uh, it's only an hour. Um, and there's many things to say about scenario analysis. So I'm going to try to give you the main, uh, uh, the main story. Uh, and hopefully, you can have some, some fruitful discussion about that. Um, the story or the presentation that I have, I, I should warn you up front. Um, uh, I have been doing this kind of presentations as well for uh, the Dutch counterpart of your organization. Uh, so you're probably going to evaluate me afterwards on the content of the presentation. I can also evaluate you a bit and compare you to your Dutch, to your Dutch counterpart. So, uh, <coughs> okay, the story uh, that I have uh, prepared. It has basically two uh, blocks. Uh, the first is the part on what are scenarios and what can you use them uh, for. Uh, that, that's, that's the, and, and how do they fit in uh, an approach to risk management? Ex ante, forward-looking risk management and strategic decision making. That's the first block. The second block is then going to go into more depth into how can you generate scenarios for these purposes. Uh, and indeed, the, 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 they're going to be with frequency domain types of techniques uh, which are not very familiar in finance and economics uh, in general, but nevertheless I think have some uh, some appeal. So that's the two, uh, the two big parts. So we, and in, in the whole line, we're going to start off quite broad, and slowly we're going to move into uh, uh, more detail and be a bit more uh, specific. So in the beginning, if it's a bit general, hang in there. We're going to get more uh, specific. So first of all, this slide. Um, the general formulation of uh, a decision-making problem, a financial decision-making problem uh, looking at the future. Uh, what is there in general lines, whether it's for a pension plan or insurance company or a sovereign wealth fund or uh, even an individual, uh, there are some things to make a decision about. Simple example, asset allocation. How do you divide your money across different asset classes? At the top, there are of course objectives. Uh, there's some reason why you invest. Uh, there are objectives in the long run or in the short run uh, which you want to meet. Uh, if there would be a one-to-one -one correspondence, let's say, between an asset allocation and how that would play out uh, in the future, uh, things would be easy and we wouldn't be sitting here together. Right? The key thing is, of course, that in the middle there's a lot of uncertainty in the world that lies ahead of us. How will financial markets evolve? How will economies evolve? And how they will evolve will have an impact on how good or bad our decisions that we make over here will play out in terms of our objectives. Right? So the key thing is uncertainty that lies ahead of us. We are, need, we are in an area where we need to make decisions under a lot of uncertainty which is ahead of us. And scenario analysis basically is an approach for dealing with that uh, uncertainty. Yeah, so scenario analysis, the approach is mainly about this middle, uh, this middle part. A bit more formal, what is a scenario? If you look into the, the literature, the operations research uh, uh, type of literature, I always use these two type of definitions, which I think yeah, give a quite good picture of what it's all about. The first one says, a scenario is a possible evolution of the future consistent with a clear set of assumptions. And there are two things important in there. The clear set of assumptions is the first one, which basically says, OK, if we're talking about the future, nobody knows what will happen. So first of all, everybody, one way or other, will be making assumptions about how the future can evolve. And this just says, if you're making these assumptions, just make sure that they're clear and that you know what you're doing. The second one, consistent, sounds a bit trivial. Uh, if you've formulated your assumptions, yeah, just implement accordingly. Uh, but in practice, that can be still quite tedious. But uh, in principle, it just says, do what you intend uh, to do. The second definition, you can read it for yourself, but it emphasizes one important, another important aspect of scenario analysis or scenario definitions, the inter interdependency. If you're thinking about a scenario, it's not just about how 
GDP growth will go or how inflation will evolve or how equity markets will evolve. It's about how they will evolve together. And so what a scenario is a possible evolution of the future, basically of all financial markets and all uh, economic uh, variables together, including uh, correlation. And so don't think in terms of one dimension, but in a multidimensional uh, approach. <coughs> well, how can scenario analysis help in improving those decisions uh, that we make, those strategy decisions that we make. And it can be illustrated according to this picture. On the left hand side, you see an example of scenarios, in this case scenarios of some interest rate. Horizontal axis is the future in years, uh, going from one until five years, and on the vertical axis you see the level, the value of the yield, or the interest rate. A blue line is one individual scenario, so one possible evolution of the future, only for the interest rate. The yellow lines altogether are a thousand other potential scenarios. Uh, and the orange line in the middle is the expectation. Is the expectation. We typically do not use the word forecast, it's the expectation. Because what's the difference between a forecast and scenario? The forecast would only show you the orange line and not take into account the uncertainty that there is around that central line. That's one of the key ideas, of course, uh, of scenario analysis. Well, we're going to be talking later on about how do you construct these scenarios. For the moment, just think uh, they are there. Uh, what do you need more? You need a model. You need a model which translates those scenarios into, uh, sorry, given what's called here input, but it can be those decision variables, uh, so an asset allocation, a potential asset allocation that you would want to hold, or, or an investment strategy in a wider sense, including hedging and derivatives, etc., uh, that you would like to follow. And in that model, what that does, that translates that asset allocation, let's use that for simplicity, translate that into the consequences uh, in terms of the objectives. Uh, so, so if you're in an asset liability management framework with assets and liabilities and solvency regulations and contributions, et cetera, et cetera, and this is a, you could say, a balance sheet and a profit and loss type of model. Uh, and you can use that then to produce scenarios again, but now not of financial market and economic variables, but now of variables that you are interested in to evaluate your potential decision on. And so if for a pension plan, for example, you could show here the funding ratio, the ratio of the value of the assets over the liabilities. Same interpretation of the graph and a correspondence between the two. And so the blue line over here is how the funding ratio would evolve if the interest rate would follow that scenario and if some kind of strategy would be followed then this would be the evolution of the funding ratio. And all the individual scenarios there are the same, just repeating it over and over uh, again in a Monte Carlo uh, type of way. Are you then done? No, you're not done. Because what the idea is, of course, the objective is to arrive here at scenarios which yeah, meet the objectives and the constraints of the organization or, or, or all the stakeholders. If it doesn't meet the objectives, the funding ratio would be too low or the risk is too high, you typically leave the scenarios intact, you go back over here, and you try another asset allocation. Rerun the calculations and see how that works out in terms of these objectives. And the, idea, the conceptual idea is that you keep circling over here, experimenting with different strategies until you find or identify strategies which yeah, meet your objectives as best as possible. That's the whole idea. And so it's a kind of a Monte Carlo version of the world uh, and use it as a kind of management flight simulator and just experiment with strategies and see how they work out under all kinds of, of scenarios. Yeah? And indeed questions fine at the end, if there are burning questions in the middle, please do not hesitate to uh, jump in. Um, that's one part of the story, yeah? so these are the, the, you could say, the rudimentary calculations that you do. If you are really moving into a decision-making space, yeah? so really comparing different strategies, it's not very convenient if you're looking at these kind of graphs all the time and comparing them with each other. What you need are kind of summary statistics, which summarize expected returns and risk in a general sense. Yeah? So in terms of these, not just in terms of expected return and volatility of return, but it can also be downside solvency risk, uh, for example. And so risk and return measures, which are relevant 
in terms of the actual objectives and constraint that the institution or the individual uh, has. Well, one of the nice things about scenario analysis is you basically can think of any risk and return measure uh, and you can calculate it from the scenarios. And so here's a list uh, uh, which you can read yourself of, of, of risk return measures you can use. Why can you use basically any of them? Uh, well, because it's based on the scenarios. And you can show that on an example, a path probability. And so what is the probability that somewhere in the coming 15 years, let's say these are years, in the coming 15 years that you will ever arrive at a funding ratio below a certain threshold, below 100 or below 50 or whatever. Suppose these are a number of scenarios. And what you then do, well, you just count or identify the number of scenarios which in that 15 years ever, one period or more periods in a row, ever fall below that threshold. You just count the number of scenarios, suppose it's 10, and you divide it over the total number of scenarios, which suppose it's 100, well, you have 10 out of 100, so you get a 10% probability. That's a very simple math. Given that you have the scenarios, you can calculate any kind of uh, risk and return measures. That's the basic idea. And on these risk and return measures, you can then compare, start comparing uh, uh, strategies. You can also use it for risk management uh, purposes. So I want to show you a few examples uh, uh, what that looks like. And so we call that integrated exante risk management, and both strategy formulation, portfolio construction, and also the risk management and monitoring uh, of your strategy. Uh, just a few examples on, on, on what that looks like. Again, assuming you have the scenarios already, and I have not said anything yet about how these scenarios are generated. The first thing, uh, the first ingredient of that exante risk management is then this stochastic scenario analysis, which I basically already told you. Uh, uh, given that you have a set of scenarios, given that you have, for example, your current portfolio composition, uh, so how is it divided across the asset classes, the maturity distributions, the rating distributions, and a strategy for taking the portfolio forward, fixed allocation, rebalancing rules, overlays, et cetera, et cetera. If you have all of that, you can simulate under all these scenarios, for example, the value of your assets. Right? Same interpretation of the graph. This is the expected evolution, the expected evolution of the assets and the wide range of scenarios uh, around that. That's the index, and these are then just the, uh, the returns. Well, you may wonder hey, why at all use such a stochastic Monte Carlo type of approach, and why not work, for example, with analytical approaches? Yeah, so write out an analytical mathematical formulation of your problem, work out the optimal solution, and produce a report with the numbers. Why do you want to work with scenario analysis? Well, one of the reasons, or two, ma two main reasons why, it, at least it always had made me enthusiastic, is uh, first of all, flexibility. And so no matter how, you could almost say, no matter how complex your investment strategy is in terms of dynamic rebalancing rules and overlays and derivatives, et cetera, or you have very complex solvency regulation as an insurance company, for example, uh, you have uh, complex dynamics in your contribution policy as a pension plan. And so all these kinds of complexities are typically not a limitation to be applied in scenario analysis. While, on the other hand, if you use these analytical approaches, yeah, just take the typical academic publications, they just start with, well, we make these and these and these simplifying assumptions because then we can fit it in a formula. Uh, well, I, I know if you've ever tried going to uh, a client and then telling you, well, you've simplified your situation in this and this way, and given these simplifications, we think this is the right thing for you to do. That's problematic, of course. You want to get as close as possible to the real world as you can. Of course, it's, at the end of the day, it's still a model. Uh, it's supporting decision making, but you need to get as close as possible to the true problem to have yeah, the, 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 uh, the largest value in the, in, in the results that you come up with. So flexibility, flexibility. Other one, uh, other important reason, or uh, pro of scenario analysis, you can already see it from these kind of graphs and also from the next type of graphs I'm going to show you. It has a lot of graphical ingredients. And so a lot of complex calculations are underlying uh, the approach. But if you're talking at a decision-making level, uh, an investment committee or a board of a plan, you work with graphical representations. And it's typically 
relatively easy for people to relate to that and also uh, therefore uh, gain understanding of why certain decisions are good or why certain decisions are not good. So it has a very good communication value, which is important at the end of the day if you want people to actually make a change, right? so to take a decision rather than getting a thick report, putting it on the shelf and, and keep doing what, what, what they were doing already. And so understanding communication is also an important uh, uh, pro of the scenario analysis approach. I already said only looking at these rudimentary calculations uh, is typically not enough when you start really experimenting with alternative strategies. What you do then is then you make these risk and return calculations, uh, as I told you, uh, so CVARs or probabilities or expected returns, four different strategies and then plot them against each other in a graph. So here you see on the horizontal axis it has something like the expected uh, cumulative real return on a 10-year horizon and on the vertical axis it's the 10% CVAR of the cumulative real return. Uh, so a case where there would be some inflation objective uh, to compensate for purchasing power. The pie charts represent then different asset allocations uh, where red could be equities and, and green could be fixed income in a very simplistic way and you can then calculate these efficient frontiers. Underlying each of these pie charts are these rudimentary scenario simulations. The economic scenarios underlying them is the same. Yeah, so if you want to compare them in the, in, in the same Monte Carlo world, but the difference is of course in terms of the strategies, in terms of the allocations uh, that you run. And what do you do then in this space? Of course, yeah, looking for efficiency improvements, yeah, so moving the efficient frontier out in terms of the objectives and the criteria that you have. So you want to move to the top right corner, highest expected return, lowest risk, because it's, it's negative and the CVARs. And if you have arrived there, if you have identified your efficient frontier, you need a kind of a risk budget, and some, some kind of a risk limit. And if you have the risk limit, you can actually identify your optimal uh, uh, decision, uh, your optimal, optimal asset allocation. And that makes it kind of full circle. Eh? So having this very basic problem, you need to make some decisions under uncertainty. Well, you've translated your objectives in terms of basically any risk and return criteria. You have a model for your strategy, how that translates into these objectives. You have the scenarios. And when you are in this space, you start doing your analysis and actually end up with an optimal strategy for a certain time period in certain conditions. Yeah, that's the, the strategy uh, application of, uh, of, of the scenarios. Well, what we have learned at least uh, over the last couple of years, of course, and the same may hold uh, for you, uh, uh, just having a strategy, a long-term strategy, and then implementing it and, well, go do something else and look later on whether you've succeeded or not is, of course, not the right way to do. Of course, you need to carefully monitor your strategy as you go along to see whether your strategy is still in line with what you uh, assumed originally and need to update the situation on how financial markets have uh, evolved. Also there the scenarios play a role. Then you typically do not start experimenting anymore with strategies. You take your current strategy and you just update it to the latest market conditions and the latest uh, portfolio conditions. And, so, and this would be as an example from December 2010. Uh, this is uh, the funding ratio of a pension plan, uh, which doesn't want to be below one, so 100% funding ratio. The blue lines are the 10% quantiles from the distribution, which was projected from December 2010. And the red line is then what actually happened subsequently until end of 2011, as an example. And the idea is, of course, then you start monitoring you know, how, have the, how has the realization fallen into the distribution that I assumed? And of course, if from here I'm looking forward again, you know, is this still the right strategy to follow? So scenarios also play a role in the risk management or the risk monitoring of your strategy. Same type of scenarios. Well, the final example, what you can do with the scenarios in this risk management approach is make risk decompositions. And so there's a lot of financial market and economic variables underlying the results that you get. And in learning about you know, where does most of the risk in my portfolio come from, 
uh, a useful tool is a risk decomposition. Also that, again, because of the flexibility of scenario analysis, you can calculate it on any measure basically that you like. This is, this is some surplus at risk measure, where this would be the total risk. And you see here how it is built up from different sources, interest rates, equities, inflation, and at the end is brought down by a diversification element. Different, sorry. So this is not analytical, but you just yeah. write explanations about this thing. Yeah, exactly that, exactly. Of course, different ways of doing a risk decomposition. This is a scenario-based version of a risk decomposition. You basically just uh, label your risk drivers according to these categories, and indeed you run the simulations with and without these risk drivers switched on, you could say, and then look at the different risk components, and you have the total, and the difference is just uh, the diversification, yes. Okay. Uh, applications, well, I already said to you, uh, uh, this, uh, this can be applied for both strategy work, portfolio construction, and risk monitoring work, eh? uh, all scenario-based. It is also uh, very much applicable to different yeah, types of organizations or different types of problems. And both on the institutional side, it's, it's being used for pensions, it's used for insurance companies, uh, private wealth, uh, oh, sorry, sovereign wealth funds are also more and more getting interested in this approach. And other types of versions, but same idea, are also being applied in the private wealth uh, space. Of course, all in very different versions, let's say. Yeah? So the, uh, the communication to individual clients, of course, is something very different than to a professional uh, investor. But the core idea is still uh, the same. Okay, so you can imagine that uh, having said this, that what these scenarios look like, uh, how they behave, what are their correlations, what are their volatilities, will have an impact on all these type of results. And therefore it will have an impact on actual decisions that uh, people and organizations will make. So it's very important to think carefully about how do you formulate these scenarios, rather than just simulating some random numbers and then go on with your detailed work. At least that's what I've learned a long time ago. So you need to think very carefully about uh, how do you generate uh, these scenarios. Um, what is the basis, I'm going to take this, what's the basis then, what is the potential basis for producing these scenarios? Um, I should say, first of all, if uh, you know the word, scena so the word scenario or Monte Carlo, probably also from another area of uh, uh, valuation. So the valuation of uh, uh, derivatives, for example. Also there you encounter the word Monte Carlo or scenarios. Those are risk neutral or valuation type of scenarios. I'm talking now about risk management, real world type of scenarios. And those are quite different uh, 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 flavors. As a basis for building these real world scenarios, uh, what's the end objective that we have? The end objective that we have, of course, that these scenarios bear resemblance to what can actually happen in the world that lies ahead of us. Because if they are not realistic, and if they bear no resemblance to what can actually happen in the world ahead of us, also our decisions you know, will not be in line with what can happen. And therefore, we will not have you know, the, the best results uh, that we set out to achieve. Um, well, there are two basic ways you could think about you know, how you, how you want to set up these scenarios. One would be great if there would be theory, which could help us. If there would be one theory which says, you know, how do financial markets, how do econ economies evolve over time, who do they, how do they correlate with each other, uh, it has been validated against the data, the academics agree. Well, in economics and finance we're not there yet, and for a very long time probably not. Are we completely lost then as a basis for scenarios? No, we're not. Because if you look carefully in the data, you look in the literature, you look at the models, what you see is a kind of a list of what we call stylized facts. Uh, so things that most people agree upon and saying, okay, these are things which are really out there. And if you think about you know, how financial markets and economies evolve, these type of issues should be included in there. And you see typically that these stylized facts, they have their own line of literature. They have their own types of models. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, and that's the basis for producing scenarios. I'm going to take you through a few examples um, and then uh, uh, summarize them and then we're going to move on to uh, how you do the techniques. 
they go a bit from long to short term. The first one is the term structure of risk and return. That's the notion that risk and return properties can be different depending on the investment horizon. The key example we always give is the correlation between equity returns and inflation. Cumulative equity returns and cumulative inflation across the investment horizon. This is the horizon in years, 20 years into the future. And on the vertical axis, it's correlation between equities and inflation. Then you see different lines. The solid blue line is very long-term historical US data based. You see that this correlation hovers around zero until seven or eight years. So not very much correlation between equities and inflation. But for longer horizons, you see it gradually moving up. And so there's a pattern in this correlation which depends on the horizon, on the term. So there's a term structure in this correlation. The other lines you see in here, the, the thin red line is also for the US, but now not calculated from historical data, but calculated from scenarios, which are simulated with the approach I'm going to be telling you a bit about. It's not exactly the same, but the idea is that you see that this increasing pattern is observed in the scenarios in a similar way as it has been observed uh, uh, in the data. And the other lines you see in there are for other countries and regions, and that's just to illustrate that something is not a stylized fact. If it is just observed for some country or some time period, it needs to be kind of a broader concept. And also in the academic literature, there are also some, some review or <coughs> overview papers now on this topic in general. Uh, what do we know about this term structure of risk and return? Campbell and Vichira, if you know that line of literature, they were the first, at least in the academic side, to look at the consequences of these type of properties for optimal asset allocations across the investment horizon. Because obviously, if you have some inflation target and leaving all else unchanged, if you have a correlation around zero or a correlation around 0.2 or 0.3, will have an impact on the optimal amount of equities in your allocation. And so if you're thinking about scenarios for all these applications I talked about, you need to deal with this stylized fact one way or the other. On the medium term, a second stylized fact that you need to include or need to think about carefully is business cycle behavior. Uh, recession, depression, recovery, uh, all the, uh, uh, the, the words are a crisis, uh, all the words, of course, from the news of the last couple of years. People have thought several times in the past that it doesn't exist anymore and that we would only have stable growth and high stable growth uh, with no, no hiccups on the way. Every time, of course, we're proven differently. Uh, um, uh, so what is it about? It's about medium-term deviations from longer-term structural growth paths. There's a lot known about that. Uh, started also in the, uh, in the US with the NBER, started collecting information about, you know, what do we know about business cycle behavior? What are the lead lag relations between variables? What are the type? What are the, is the average length of the cycles, et cetera, et cetera. Example of what type of information uh, uh, we are talking about. Here you see from 1974 onwards, the blue line is the OECD composite leading indicator. Just taken from the OECD website, you know, how does the OECD try to pre-track basically what's the state of the business cycle in general for all developed uh, countries. The, the red line is a kind of a counterpart of that, which just pops out quite naturally from the methodology we're going to be spending a bit of time on. And so it's not exactly the same. It was also not designed to mimic the OECD indicator or something, but you see that it, it shows a similar uh, pattern. And the idea now, if you use the red type of information for producing scenarios going forward, you say, can say, well, I have produced scenarios in which business cycle behavior is included in a similar way as an organization like the OECD measures the state of the business cycle. And for the careful observers, you can also see that the red one tends to be a bit leading on the blue one, which may sound a bit strange yeah, because the leading indicator of the OECD is meant to lead on the business cycle, and apparently the lead can be improved. Um, we know from correspondence that it's actually true, so it's not some artifact or something. And that is for two reasons. One is uh, OECD tries to keep their methodology relatively simple because so that the people can replicate it or uh, check the calculations. So they've given in a bit on the, on, on, the, on the leading quality. The other difference is that in the red one, there's much more financial market uh, information used than by the OECD. OECD is very macro uh, type. 
A key message here is that if you think if you're simulating scenarios for the medium term, you need to think carefully about the business cycle and uh, business cycle behavior. How do you get that into your uh, scenarios? Well, then if you move to the shorter horizons, you get the obvious or the usual suspect, you could say from the risk management world, volatility. Uh, for example, we know that volatility is not stable, it varies uh, over time. It's also not just in equities, it's in all kinds of asset classes. It's correlated across variables. Uh, it has certain dynamics over time. Type of models over here, of course, arch and gauge models. And the typical way of dealing with this, uh, uh, this phenomenon, uh, which can get you the, uh, the Nobel Prize. So if you're simulating scenarios typically for the shorter run, volatility and how it moves should be included. Another one from that line is tail risk. Uh, the notion that when things are really going really bad, eh, if we're moving in the, really the, the left tails of the distributions, correlations are typically much higher than in more stable times. Uh, of course, it has been learned again also during the crisis. An example here, this is, are the quantiles of the distribution. We're looking here at the correlation between US equity returns and European equity returns, monthly returns. And 0.10 then means the worst 10% returns. And 0.05 means the worst 5% returns, and so forth. So if you move to the left, we move into the tail of the distribution. Then the green line shows you a correlation, a normal correlation, if you ignore that that correlation can vary across the distribution. You would find a correlation historically of some 0 0.75, 0 0.8. If you look more carefully in the data, you get the blue line where you see, well, here it's similar, but if you move into the left tail of the distribution, this correlation moves to one, very close to one. So there's much more codependency between the variables in the tail uh, than in a normal circumstance. And the red line now is the counterpart of that, but now not calculated from historical data, but from the scenarios, uh, which shows you not exactly the same, but that the scenarios have indeed captured this type of stylized fact in an adequate way. Well, if you sum that all together, you get this kind of list of stylized facts that you would like to include in your scenarios if you want them to be realistic or plausible uh, looking forward. Eh? Term structure of risk and return, business cycle, behavior, volatility, and tail risk. Well, we know a lot of things also about distributions, eh, that they're not normal but skewed, and fat tails. Term structures, we know about how yield curves move, and eh? we have parallel movements and tilt movements, all these special factor models available there. Uh, for yield curves. On the dotted line, at this high level, you could still say there's something like seasonal behavior. Uh, typical macro variables show seasonal patterns. What could you say then if you want to simulate realistic or plausible scenarios going forward, and you want to use that for decision-making purposes, strategy formulation, risk management purposes, you want to include all of these things in that framework. So that's kind of the objectives you could formulate for producing yeah, good real-world uh, scenarios. Everybody with me still? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm notorious for having trouble with time, so <laughs> I, I, that's why I check my, 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 my time schedule now and then. Okay. Now we've talked about what are scenarios, what can you use them for, and what is the kind of a basis you can use to construct these scenarios, and these stylized facts. Key question then is of course, how do you do it? So how do you produce scenarios in which all of these things are represented in an adequate uh, way? Uh, that's of course where, where most of the work uh, is. And indeed, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, uh, the approach, or the, the, the approach that I want to be uh, talking a bit about is indeed a frequency domain type of approach which helps you to actually achieve this. And so I must say this is an approach of scenario analysis which we as a company and also me as a person uh, think is, is, is a good way to do it. It's, it's a way which, which has proven that it can do these things we talked about. Does it mean it's the only way you can do it? No, it's not the only way. Of course there are more uh, uh, possibilities, but I'm going to telling you, be telling you about this approach. In general, for the approaches, you could say that uh, there are two big lines. Uh, one is time series modeling in general. So classical time series modeling approaches for producing the scenarios. 
this one is, is basically in that category, you could say, and also encompass is some of the more uh, 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 classical ways of doing that. The other category is more um, yeah, stochastic differen differential equation based, so risk neutral, you know, Black Scholes, whole white type of, of, of models, which are also being being used for these purposes, and they all have their their pros and cons. So this is a, an, an approach from the um, uh, from the class from from the time series modeling, where it's what is a bit specific is indeed that it uses a frequency domain uh, 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 approach. At the heart of that approach, and it's the, the most important thing that I want to want to share with you, um, is a decomposition approach. And it's a bi-orthogonal decomposition approach. I didn't think of that name myself. It was a very bright guy at a European insurance company. When I talked to this about him, he said, ah, you're doing a bi-orthogonal decomposition. A, uh, but after that, I understood what he meant. So bi-orthogonal, it means bi, yeah, two. So we're doing a decomposition across two dimensions. And the word orthogonal, which means zero correlation. Yeah, so they are orthogonal to each other. So it's two decompositions which are orthogonal. The first of these decompositions is a decomposition across horizons and frequencies. As an example here, you see US <coughs> equity data, total return basis on a logarithmic scale from 1900, so very long-term data. It has been decomposed, that historical data, into these three colored lines, the red one, the green one, and the uh, purple one in such a way that if you just add up these colored lines, you get the blue one. So it's just an additive decomposition. Very simple at the end of the day. I already told you it's orthogonal. If you put these things in a spreadsheet and you calculate the correlation, you will find a correlation of zero between these components. So they're orthogonal. What is special otherwise about it, and you can already see that graphically, of course, that the red one captures kind of the long-term trending type of behavior in the index. The green one tries to focus or emphasize the medium-term business cycle type of fluctuations in the index, and the purple one is more the intra-year erratic type of movements in the index. I mean, did, cannot show you that here, but intuitively you can think that the red one is very much driving, let's say, the decade returns in the index, the green one is very much driving the annual returns in the index, and the purple one is very much driving the monthly returns in the index. So that's how you can think of them approximately. I could show you, but it's not included here. Well, what can you do with this? On the one hand, you can use this to analyze historical data. Eh? So separately look at the long-term correlations and the short-term correlations, for example. And by the way, a decomposition approach is also not uh, 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 unique or something. Eh? So that's also very well uh, known. It was already, uh, Tim Berg already said, you know, if you think about financial markets and economies, it's a trend, it's a cycle, it's a seasonal, and it's an irregular. It's also already a decomposition idea. Business cycle indicator literature is all about decompositions, decomposing the trend from uh, the cyclical deviation. So th that's not unique, it's just the way that you make the decomposition. Um, well, you can use it to analyze these components separately, but most importantly, what you can do with it you can also use that, those components to build scenario models, dedicated scenario models for the long term, for the medium term, and for the short term. So this is the counterpart looking forward of the same graph. So same setup, this is the total logarithmic US stock price index, total return, and these are the components. Eh? So the trend, the business cycle, and the monthly component. A thousand simulations from each component going forward, so let's say 30 years on a monthly basis. Same interpretation as the graphs as I showed you in the beginning. Yeah, so blue is just one, number 500 something, and the, the yellow ones are the other, 1,000 Monte Carlo simulations, and the orange line is the expectation. So separate models here have been constructed for simulating the long, medium, and the short term, focusing on that long-term return behavior, the medium-term return behavior, and the short-term return behavior. But of course, we're not interested in these components as such. What matters at the end of the day is this one, right? the, the total scenarios of the US stock price index. How can they evolve? It would give you something like this. And then the key question, which I haven't said anything yet about why do you need to do it in this way? Right? Why not just take monthly returns, build a model, and simulate from that? Again, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but if you start digging into the properties of these scenarios and start looking, for example, uh, 
at this term structure of risk and return, and how is the correlation between equity and inflation across the horizon, then by doing it in this way, that's a robust way of getting the job done. Robust, I mean, if you add a little data, you re-estimate the models, the structure of the model stays in place. Where classical models have the tendency to be very sensitive in terms of their estimation results. Projecting long-term correlations all of a sudden, you know, completely upwards or completely downwards. So it's a way of getting these stylized facts in there by zooming in on the different type of characteristics of the data. Yeah. This is the first uh, decomposition. The second decomposition, uh, what does that relate to? That relates to the fact that what I just talked about is just US equities. And I said you in, in the beginning already, scenario analysis is about many variables, many financial markets, many asset classes, many economies at the same time. So how do you deal with the interdependencies, with the correlations between the variables? I, and, uh, and that's where the other decomposition comes in. What you can do there is work with factor models. That's a typical way of dealing uh, with, with these correlations. Uh, factor models. And an example, what I showed you here, all these, this is zooming in on the business cycle uh, part, the business cycle component. From 1974 again, you see all these colored lines. One of them is US equities. Uh, so that was that one, but then from 74, so that's US equities. But now it's been complemented with 300 other business cycle components of other equities, uh, interest rates, volatilities, credits, GDP, CPI, uh, exchange rates across a wide range of countries. Basically mostly developed countries over here. Producing around 300 of these business cycle components of a lot of financial market and economic variables. Uh, in there together describing the overall business cycle behavior or business cycle dynamics. Well, to extract the most important information from that, you can use principal component factors. And a principal component factor is just a linear combination of all these time series, which captures the largest part of the joint behavior. I see all you, most of you nodding, so you know PCA. Uh, and here you see uh, the weights from the first principal component factor. So now this is not time, but these are 300 variables. And if you just multiply these weights with these 300 lines, you get the red line. And so the first PCA is the linear combination of all this data, which extracts the largest portion of the joint behavior of all these 300 business cycle filtered series, producing you the red line. And this is the line I showed you together with the OECD leading indicator. So it's just taking a lot of financial market and economic data, isolating the business cycle part of the behavior, and extracting the first principal components factor. That's all that it does. Producing you this line with the familiar dating eh, of the troughs. I've learned a long time ago to pronounce it in English. And so the, the lows in there. <laughs> uh, I, thought, I thought it was troughs, but it's troughs. <laughs> so beginning of the 80s, 90s, 2000, 08. And so the familiar dating just you know, pops up, basically. This is just one factor, and this is only just um, uh, uh, within the business cycle component. To capture uh, sufficiently, let's say, the joint behavior, you, you typically need more than one factor. Uh, so you, you use 10 factors, for example, to capture all the, the joint behavior. And the second thing is you can do the same trick in the other components. Uh, so I was talking about this business cycle part now. You can do the same thing for the trend model and the same thing for the, uh, for the monthly uh, model. And then this bi-orthogonal approach, this is what it boils down to. You start off with a lot of data, you take it apart with this decomposition approach in terms of frequencies and horizon, isolating long-term, medium-term and short-term behavior. Per component, you then build a factor model. You could say a classical dynamic factor model, where the factors drive the joint behavior of them. And then when you have the simulations of the factors, yeah, you can use them very easily to also actually produce the scenarios for the equities and the GDPs and the exchange rates, etc. And that's of course what matters. And you bring it all back together at the end and you have your scenarios uh, for all your variables and all your time horizons. Uh, that's the, that's the, that's the 
the core idea of this, this bi-orthogonal uh, approach, which, which helps you to capture long, medium, and short-term behavior in your scenarios as you would like it to be according to these uh, stylized facts. This one I'm going to skip. And just a short version is, you need more than this. <laughs> and so if you want to have stochastic volatility, if you want to have tail risk, if you want to have yield curves in there, this is not enough. So you need kind of add-ons uh, uh, to get them in there. But they can be integrated in the same framework. Two things I still want to do. One is show you uh, an example what type of output you can get from such an approach. Uh, and focusing then for a moment on this business cycle uh, area. What you see here in this graph, this runs until March of this year. The line you see over here is the first business cycle factor. So again, the one I showed you together with the OECD. And so it, it kind of mimics the general state of the business cycle. The, the lines, the colored lines plotted over each other are the assessment based on this framework based on data, well, the last one is until March, until February, until January, until December, until November. So as more information becomes available, how does this approach assess the overall state of the business cycle? Where the dotted line is today, you could say. One key difference with an OECD type of approach is that once you have this business cycle data and you have your dynamic factor model on this business cycle data, you can make scenario projections going forward of the business cycle. And so what's according to this methodology based on where do we stand today and what's kind of the average historical business cycle dynamics, what's then the assessment according to this methodology of the world that lies ahead of us? So after the dotted line, it gives the expectation going forward. This is only the expectation. And so you see you get this pattern over here which basically says, well, you know, there's been a bit of a turnaround. We are very high, we are, 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 are at the top, uh, basically. Well, we may linger on still at a high level for quite some time, but then there's a turnaround to come. And you can think of this one, this is very much directly related to equity type of, uh, equity credit type of uh, asset classes, and also GDP uh, related. So you get an expectation of the state of the business cycle four years to come. Important remark, going back again to the beginning, uh, scenario analysis is not forecasting. Uh, and so if you tell a scenario person that they're forecasting, they get kind of <laughs> un 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 uncomfortable. The key thing is, of course, that you have an expectation, but around that, that's uncertainty. And scenario analysis, especially about taking into account this uncertainty. And that you can see in this graph, same idea. And so this is the business cycle indicator going forward, the expectation. But now with these red lines in there, they indicate the 10% quantiles of the distribution. So underlying that you can think of scenarios and just putting them in portions of 10%. Yes? And from this you can deduce, well, there's actually probability of an improvement, further on improvement still, but there's also probability of a much faster uh, turnaround. And well, actually, if you look over here, you know, the values of R8, of course, they have a low probability, but they are in that range as well. So you can make also probability-based assessments about the state uh, of the business cycle. And recently we have been, very recently we have been doing some very formal backtesting of ex type of experiments. Uh, there's also the question which obviously pops up if you look at this, uh, 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 on, on this approach. And especially in this business cycle area, uh, uh, you can show that you can actually do better with these factor models than with a random walk type uh, of approach. We can actually show that you can get a little bit better forecasting uh, 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 or, uh, yeah, if you look at purely from the forecasting perspective. So this actually gives you some confidence you know, that there's relevance, because if you feel there's relevance in this historical data, in this business cycle behavior as a stylized fact, that it says something about the future, yeah, then you should be able to show also that it uh, it has its value, and, 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 and that's actually uh, uh, possible. <coughs> and a way of thinking about that um, uh, is, um, especially for this audience perhaps, uh, if you look at the Financial Analyst Journal some time ago, two years ago or so, there was an interview with Eugene Fama, one of the founders of the efficient market hypothesis, of the capital asset pricing model, 
And this is a really nice quote he said in an interview um, with, with, with Robert Litterman. Uh, he said, in the beginning we thought price changes were uh, random, that, that that was what efficient markets meant, so we don't know anything at all. Later on he says, now we know better. We say, he says, market efficiency means that deviations from equilibrium expected returns are unpredictable. We do not know where we will fall into the distribution, of course. But he says, ex equilibrium expected returns can vary over time in a predictable way. And as a result, overall, the returns have a little bit of predictability in there. And so these variations in equilibrium expected, in equilibrium expected returns have to do, of course, with changing uh, risk preferences, for example, uh, over time. And the, what I showed you with this business cycle indicator, and here it is in terms of some other variables, and so equities, high yield spreads, and, and exchange rates, and you look at the direction of the distribution projected from a certain date in the past, and how the realization has fallen in, yeah, where exactly in the realization you know, the spreads have fallen, we don't know, but the direction of the expected returns and how the realization has fallen show a very interesting relation. So this way of looking at uh, returns and distributions very much links to uh, how, how someone like using Pharma thinks about that. Just one final remark, I'm not going to do this in total. Um, all this I talked about is scenario analysis based on stylized facts, which are derived from literature, but also a lot about historical data. So it builds on the presumption that there's relevance in historical data for looking at the future. Already since the very early days of scenarios, people have realized that, of course, that in itself is not enough or may not be enough to get the best forward-looking scenarios. Why not? There may be changes uh, over time uh, which impact the future, which were not in the historical data. And so when we, uh, for example, uh, from a long time ago, it was the, uh, the European Central Bank introduced its inflation target. Uh, at the moment they introduced that, if you look back at the historical data, that information was not included. So inflations were, for, for Europe, were much above 2%. If you would then have to, given that information, project your expected inflation rate going forward, of course you want to take into account what the European Central Bank has said about its inflation target. And so then you put in additional forward-looking, you could say view type of information into your historical base framework. In today's situation, it would of course be central bank intervention and the effect that has on interest rates not included in, in, in that extent in the historical data on, on which you build your models. You can also have other examples. You can have an investment committee of a pension plan which has certain views on the equity risk premium, for example, and you want to include them in your scenarios. Or you want to do sensitivity uh, uh, analysis. So I just want to make the remark that it's important in scenarios that you not only you know, do your best as possible to extract information from historical data and literature, but also allow for taking into account additional uh, forward-looking information uh, for, use, for producing the best uh, forward-looking uh, scenarios. Well, if you summarize that, uh, we've talked about stochastic scenario analysis, uh, which in our experience is a very powerful tool to support strategy decision-making and also uh, risk management in an integral way. The properties of the scenarios that you put in there uh, are very important because if they are different, the results from the models will be different and the, re the decisions that people make will be different and that will actually impact you know, to what extent will you achieve your objectives uh, or not. Uh, well, what I haven't put too much emphasis on, but it's also important if you think about these different applications, eh, so long-term strategy and short-term risk management, and all these stylized facts, which you typically see that people have different models for different purposes. A separate model for the long run and another model which is good at tail risk, for example. Well, of course, strategy, portfolio construction, and risk management are integrated e with each other. So if you go through that process, and along the way you switch from the underlying scenario model, you're in trouble with consistency. Because right? a strategy which may be working well in scenario model A may no longer be the optimal strategy in scenario model B. So it's important to think about also about consistency in your scenario framework. Well, we looked at these stylized facts, and they uh, are a valuable basis 
for producing scenarios. Also, if people use different methodologies, it's my experience at the end of the day, most scenario builders will recognize the list of stylized facts we talked about as a basis for producing your scenarios and also evaluating whether you have uh, uh, good scenarios. Well, it's indispensable to allow uh, for views, yeah, for additional forward-looking information, and I told you a bit about this frequency domain type of technique as one of the possibilities uh, for getting these stylized facts into the scenarios. And that leaves us still a little bit of time for the... Uh, <laughs> four, according to my schedule. <laughs> Are there any questions or remarks? That Yeah. They have a bond portfolio, but I guess in this bond portfolio, maybe they have like other government bonds and, and yeah. these are like, like individual assets, not uh, yeah. assets. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a, uh, that, 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 that's a very good point. Um, from, I, I, I can best tell it from, from, from our experience. Uh, uh, the, the level where we typically stop with the modeling at the moment is. Uh, let's say uh, 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 triple A credits US, uh, so benchmark and sub benchmark uh, uh, type of levels. Um, uh, for fixed income, the modeling typically works by simulating yield curves and putting in, you know, the actual maturity distribution and rating distribution of the client of the pension plan, for example. So then you could say, yeah, you're, you're, you're close to, you know, security level, but in an aggregated uh, way. Equity type is then more on a, on a benchmark and sub-benchmark level. In concept, for this methodology, it's not a limitation to push that further, especially also for this frequency domain technique that the original idea, my personal ambition idea for a long run still is, you know, you can simulate scenarios from let's say 30 years out uh, until uh, for the coming 10 days. So it just would, just would mean in what I talked about, eh, we have these, let's say, decade returns, annual returns, monthly returns, there would be an additional component simulating the daily returns. Conceptually, it's possible, in, in, but then you get into the, the typical short-term classical risk management uh, models, and it would be yeah, great, of course, if you could really integrate long-term strategy until really short-term operational risk management. But the typical applications of these approach typically stop at the, what we call the risk management or the risk monitoring of the strategy itself. And there the simulation, the shorter simulation horizontally of horizon is typically one month, uh, combined with yeah, this benchmark, sub-benchmark way of modeling the assets. But conceptually, no, no limitations. Any other? Can always mean two things, eh? so I, <laughs> either everything was completely clear. Please don't feel constrained by what I just said about two minutes. <laughs> no more questions. Yes. So a, de a detailed question. You, s you showed a slide with correlations between CPI and equities. Yes. Um, by horizon. Yes. Can you define horizon? Is it merely the historical period you're looking at? Um, no, no, no. Sorry. It's, um, <laughs> that was. Yeah, no, it is actually uh, uh, the, horizon, the, the horizon looking from today into the future. But based on performance? No, based on historical data. So this would take, this has taken data from, let's say, 1900, yeah, so uh, f more than a century of data. And then based on the data, you're going to collect all one year returns and all one year inflations. Calculate the correlation that gives you this number. You're going to look at all two-year returns and two-year inflations. Gives you this number until, well, the number's over here. So here it is, all the 10-year returns and all the 10-year inflations giving you this number. Yes, so you're collecting returns, not the absolute. No, not the absolute, no, because, yeah, then you would get an equity index and a price index, uh, which is not a good basis to calculate. Your, so it's cumulative returns for different investment horizons, uh, based in this case on long-term data, so that holds for the blue line. The other lines are forward-looking, calculated from the scenarios. So then just having all these scenario simulations, you do the same, but then across all the scenarios and calculate these correlations. Yeah. But that explains why at the end you 
probably need to be able to be able to say sure. Yeah, as well, as well, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, drift, but there's still, let's say the. Uh, there's still, still considerable volatility, let's say, yeah. in in 20 year returns. So, but of course, indeed, if 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 the 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 the, the, uh, the longer the horizon, the drift becomes more and more important, for sure. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. Well then, let's close. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.